Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, while you're listening to this program, you might be called to the phone to answer an easy question. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last Wednesday, my Equitable representative was telling me about a special life insurance plan they have for men and women on the way up. Believe me, that's one great life insurance plan. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give you full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Curious Patient. In studying the criminal records of the six million people in the United States today who have been arrested on charges of having committed a major crime, your FBI learned that less than 50% of those six million committed only one crime and then stopped. That is true despite the fact that they were caught and punished for that first crime. Because in the commission of their second one, they were buoyed by the optimistic thought that they had learned enough by then to commit a crime and not be apprehended. No class of people are given to such undue optimism as the criminal, because optimism is necessary to feed his ego. And so he goes from crime to crime, committing grand larceny one day, kidnapping another day, and the next day, murder. Tonight's FBI file opens in a small town in one of our northwestern states. A car drives swiftly down one of the quiet, tree-lined streets in this village. It stops in front of a large white house. A man hurriedly leaves the car and walks quickly to the front door. Just a minute. Yes? You, Dr. Crawford. That's right. Well, I'm a stranger here in town, but the fellow in the drugstore told me to come here. What about? Oh, it's my wife. Yes? Yeah, she's, she's got to have a baby. She needs some help right away. Where is she? In a cabin about 10 miles out of town. Has any other doctor been taking care of her? Uh, yeah, back home. But we've been on a trip. And she's not going to be able to make it back there. I see. Doc, can you come right now? Well, I have several other calls to make. She needs help bad. Very well. I'll get my car out and follow you. We haven't got that, that much time. You, you ride with me.
That's the cabin right there. You certainly picked an isolated spot. Well, you know what housing is. It's the only place we could find. Let's go. Surely. Is this your wife's first child? Yeah. Is there anyone else here with her? No, no, she's alone. Well, I may have to send you back to town to contact my nurse. Oh, anything you say, Doc. Here we are. Is that you, Whitey? Yeah, yeah, open up. Go ahead, Doc. Thank you. Is he a doctor? Yeah. Well, he'd better get right to work. Is this the woman who's expecting a baby? No. But you said your wife was here alone. Doc, that whole wife routine was a phony. What? You've got a real job to do. What do you mean? There's a guy in the next room with three slugs in him, and you're going to fix him up. Why do you're wasting time. Okay, Doc, get to work. Now, see here, I didn't come out to I've this... I've got a gun, Doc. Do like I say. But you have no right... Look, the guy's in real bad shape, so get started. I better tell you this. If he kicks off, you go too. Some 30 miles away at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just finishing a long-distance call. Yes. Yes, I see. Well, thanks a lot, Warden. I'll get down there right away. Goodbye. Calling it a day, huh? Jim? Oh. No, Leo, I'm afraid my day is just starting. Huh? Yes, it was a call from the warden at the county jail. A prisoner broke out down there several hours ago. Who was he? A man named George Brooks. What was he in for? He'd just been convicted on a big payroll job. Over $40,000 was stolen. Was that the one down at Salem? Yes, that's the one. Well, I remember it. Brooks worked with a partner. A partner was killed. That's it. As I recall it, the money was never recovered. No, Brooks evidently managed to hide it away at some point before he was apprehended. Mm, that's probably the reason for his breaking out. Yes, I know. And why were we called in, Jim? Well, we have a detainer on him. And it's important that we find him, too. Uh, did you get any details on the jailbreak? No, not much. The only thing the warden told me on the phone was that he was sure Brooks was wounded by one of the guards. Have the state police been alerted? Yes, all authorities have been notified. They've already set up an extensive roadblock. Leo, I'm going down there now. I'll give you a more complete story when I return. Jean, will you quit that? What? Walking up and down. Relax, will you? Oh, sure. That's a cinch. Look, there's nothing else you can do. No. You think we could go in there? No. Is that doctor any good? He's okay. How do you know? The drugstore guy in the village said he was the best doctor in the county. Oh. Jean. Yeah? You... You still go for Brooksy, don't you? Are you kidding? Well, what have you got the jumps for? I want him to live for the same reason you do. So we can find out where he planted that dough. Are you sure that's all? Oh, baby. We were washed up before he was sent away. He didn't know that. Well, you knew it. I hope. How do I know from James? Honey, if you don't know about you and me by now, turn in your suit. Now, can I walk some more? Sure. Oh. Uh, Doc, how is he? I extracted the bullets. Is he going to live? I believe so, yes. Swell. Can I talk to him now? No, he's still unconscious. Now, with your permission, I'd like to leave. Wait a minute. You're staying right here. You asked me to save a man's life. I believe I've done that. I have no further obligation. Oh, yes, you have. I have other calls to make. They can wait, Doc. We ain't satisfied with a guy that's just going to live. We want one who can talk. Are you still here, Leo? Oh, yes, Jim. Working nights this week. Oh? How did you make out? Well, I picked up a number of details on the jailbreak, but Brooks is still at large. How did he make the break? Well, the warden said he had a woman visit him last week. She was his girlfriend. Her name is Jean Dodge. Yeah? It's believed that she managed to pass him a gun. He used that gun to subdue a guard, then used the guard as cover and managed to get through the front gate. Yeah, just like that. That's it. As soon as he was outside, the guard eluded him and immediately gave the alarm. There was some shooting, but Brooks got away. And that's the last that was seen of him? Yes, but his trail was picked up. He headed through a patch of woods, and judging from the bloodstains that were found along the way, he must have been rather severely wounded. Well, surprising, then, that he escaped. Well, he had a car waiting for him. Tire tracks were found showing where it had parked, and his trail led right to it. The car got away before the roadblock took effect. I'm not so sure of that. What do you mean? 
I have an idea there was a hideout already for him not too far from the jail. Why do you think so? Well, Leo, that's sparsely settled country. There's not many roads. And less than a half an hour after the break, every car was stopped within a 50-mile radius. Oh, I see. And there's another factor that may help. If Brooks was badly wounded, he's going to need medical attention and fast. So the warden's alert... Wait a minute, Jim. What? Something came in a little while ago that ties right up with this. Oh, what is it? There's a doctor missing over in Quincy. Really? What's the story? Well, his wife reported it. Stranger came to their house about 6 o'clock this evening, Mm -hmm. told the doctor his wife was going to have a baby. They left in the man's car, and the doctor hasn't been heard from since. Did his wife see this man? No, she was in another room. She just overheard the conversation. Well, did she know where they went? No. I'd better get all the details from her at once. Look, baby, it's coming up daylight. Yeah. Don't you want to get some sleep? No, I couldn't. Well, Doc. He's conscious. You mean he can talk? Yes. Oh, nice going, Doc. Now may I leave? No, I'm afraid not. Why? You promised... I can't to... have you blowing a whistle on us. Jean, go on in and talk to Brooksy. Okay. You've got to let me go. Sorry, Doc. I'm tying you up. Now, see your... You... Jean, you know what to say to him. Yeah. I'll take care of the doc. Hello, darling. Oh. Hello, Jean. Don't move, honey. Just lie still. Okay. You want anything? No, no, no. George. Yeah? I think I know you pretty well. What you like and what you don't like. Uh Uh-huh. What you like best is the truth. (sighs) That's right, baby. Well, that's why I'm going to tell you this thing. What? That doctor who's been taking care of you. I just now talked to him. Talk to him about you. Uh-huh. What he said ain't going to be so nice for you to hear. Well, come on. Let's have it. He said you're not going to live. Oh. Maybe I did wrong in telling him this, George, but... No, I... no, 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 no. Oh, darling. Jean, don't. Don't, Jean. I'm sorry. Where's... Where's Whitey? In the next room. Does he know? Mm -hmm. George, I know this sounds corny, but is there anything you want done? I... I don't think so. What about that dough? Dough? The dough you buried. If there's anyone you want to have it, you can tell me where it is. Well, I... Ooh. I... I got a sister... She could use it. Oh, I'd be glad to see that she gets it, George. Just tell me where to find it. Okay, honey. There's a big red barn. It's on Route 18. Ten miles north of Salem. Uh Uh-huh. Go on. The dough. The dough's in the box. Buried right behind the barn. Well, well. You... You'll make sure my sister oh, gets Oh, of course, it. George. But you don't even know her name. Of, uh, of where she lives. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Wait, I'll get a pencil and write it all oh, down. Uh, hold it, hold huh? it. Call Whitey in here. I'd like to tell him about it, too. Sure, honey, sure. Whitey? Yeah, honey? You got the dock all tied up? Then come on in here. George wants to see you. Okay. Hello, George. Hello, Whitey. Jean told you, huh? Yeah. Tough going, kid. Whitey. There's... There's something I want to tell you. Go right ahead, George. I I told Jean where I buried the dough. Good. But it was the bum steer. What? What do you mean? 
I just wanted to see how far you phonies would go. George. Just stay where you are, the both of you. Now, no, wait a minute. Put down that gun. Look, you. The doc already told me where I stand. He said I'm doing fine. What's more, I know what you two are up to. What are you talking about? I got the word when I was away about both of you. Those were lies. No, no. Why do you no, look no. out? Too late, baby. <laughs> Honey, you were crying over the wrong corpse. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to men and women on the way up. To men who are confident that one of these days the boss will be calling them into his office to say, Well, Joe, we like the way you've taken hold here, so we're going to promote you to Jenkins' old job. Of course, that means a substantial increase in salary, too. Did you know that there is a special life insurance plan for men like that? For men who expect to be filling a bigger job and earning more money five years from now than they are today? It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society plan for men and women on the way up. Maybe I'm kidding myself, but I think that means me. So how about telling me a little bit more? Well, this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up has three major advantages. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third... This equitable plan is flexible at all times, can expand or contract as you see fit. Sounds okay so far, Mr. Keating. How can I get the whole story? Demonstrate that you consider yourself on the way up by getting in touch with your Equitable Society representative and asking him about this plan. Phone him as soon as possible or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Curious Patient. It was the immortal Bobby Burns who first said that the best laid plans of mice and men off go awry. And as is proven by tonight's case in the files of your FBI, that is true for criminals as well as for everybody else. This case is the perfect example of the lengths to which the criminal mind will go. The complex plans it conjures up in the mighty effort to get something for nothing. The criminal mind is incapable of realizing that the only thing you get for nothing is nothing. And because of his failure to realize that obvious truth, he goes on stealing, lying, cheating, and killing. He lives in shadows, and he trusts no one. And he has one major goal in life. He wants to commit the perfect crime. And he never finds out until too late that there can be no perfect crime. The night's file continues at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Stewart. Hello, Leo. Jim Taylor. Oh, hello, Jim. Where are you? I'm out of Dr. Crawford's house. Have you interviewed his wife? Well, the doctor himself just came home about ten minutes ago. Well, then I sent you on a wild goose chase. No, no, not at all, Leo. I'm very glad that I came here. And did his disappearance tie in with Brooks? Very much so. He was taken to a cabin where Brooks was hiding out. Oh, I see. The man who brought him there threatened him with a gun, made him take care of Brooks's wounds. After he patched him up, the doctor was then bound and thrown into a closet. Well, how'd he get away? Well, there was a fight. Brooks shot and killed his confederate. The man who drove the doctor out there? Yes. Then Brooks and his girl, who was also there, left the cabin and drove away. Well, how did Brooks manage to move? I thought he was badly wounded. Well, the girl practically carried him out. After that, the doctor managed to loosen his bonds and get out of there himself. Has the uh, doctor any idea where Brooks and the girl have gone? No. Uh, could he describe their car? Yes, yes. He gave me everything but the license number. I've already passed it on to the state police. Oh, uh, what's the next move, Jim? Can you get away from the office? Yeah, William just came in. Then get right over here, will you? The doctor will lead us out to the cabin. <laughs> Uh, 
Doctor, is this the room that Brooks was in? That's right, Mr. Taylor. Well, there doesn't seem to be anything here that would tell us where they'd gone. Oh, uh, in here, Leo. Uh, I took an impression of the tire treads from Brooks' car. Good. Did you get anything in here? No. no I, think. I think we should arrange to get the coroner around here. If we get the bullet from the dead man's body, it might be helpful to us. Oh, Leo, I just remembered. I think I know who that man is. Really? Yes. Uh, doctor, you say they called him Whitey? Yes. Well, I think I recall a petty thief called Whitey Floyd. There was a wanted circular on him. I looked at it just last week. We'll check on it as soon as we get back to the office. Right. Gentlemen, I wish I could have been more helpful to you. My doctor, after what you've been through, we appreciate your even coming out here. I wish they'd been careless enough, doctor, to let you overhear where they were going. Say, wait. There was one thing. I heard that man Brooks say... I don't think it means very much. Oh, what was it? He remarked that they'd only travel at night to lessen their chances of being found. I see. Jim... They undoubtedly have a specific destination. Oh, yes. I think I can guess where it is. Oh, where? The place that Brooks hid the money he took on the payroll job. Mm. And all we have to do is to find where he hid it. Yeah. Well, Doctor... Yes? Can you recall anything else that Brooks said? Anything at all, no matter how unimportant? Well, I... I didn't get much chance to talk to him. As soon as he regained consciousness, I was tied up. Well, did he say anything to you at all? Uh, let me see. He did speak once, but not to me. Oh, what do you mean, sir? Just as he was regaining consciousness, he mumbled something about R.I.P. Beloved Wife Abigail. R.I.P. Beloved Wife Abigail. Yes, he repeated it twice. Well, that's really cryptic. Anything else? No, I'm positive that was all. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Leo, I think we'd better get a coroner out here, then head back to the office. George. What? Don't you think you should try to get some sleep? No. Why not? I don't trust you. Oh, look, do we have to go over that whole thing again? I wasn't double-crossing you with Whitey. Mm. He made me tell that story about you dying. He said if I didn't do it, he'd... He'd, he'd kill me. No kidding. Look, you got to believe me. Stop yelling, will you? We parked this car out here in the woods to avoid people, not attract them. I'm sorry. George? What is it? If you feel like you do about me... You still think I was handing you one? Why didn't you shoot me, too? Because I needed you. Honest, honey? Just to drive the car. If I could move myself, you wouldn't be here. Hmm. I also need you to dig up that dough. We're really going to get it? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, what's so funny? (laughs) What a checker game this is. What do you mean? You're still alive because somebody's got to dig up that dough for me. I'm still alive because you wouldn't dare to slug me until I get that dough. (laughs) What a setup. George, that's not true, and you know it. No. Wait till you get your hot little hands on that money box. Then what a rat race that'll be. Oh, stop it. Look, how much longer do we have to park here? As soon as it gets dark, sweetheart, we're on our way. Jim, the coroner was just here. Gave me the bullet he took from Florence Bonnie. Good. I'm sending it right to the laboratory. Any word from the state police on Brooks? No, nothing yet. Uh, How are you making out? Well, I've been going through Brooks's complete record. So far, I've only come up with one thing out of his past. What's that? Well, as far as I can tell, he isn't married, never has been. Well, then who is his beloved wife, Abigail? And that remains a mystery. Well, what's that file you're reading? Oh, this is a complete report on the payroll sticker. Oh, well, you go right ahead. I'll go downstairs. Wait. What is it? Here's a description of how and where the police apprehended Brooks. Well? I think it clears up the identity of Abigail. Really, Jim? Yes, and if he travels at night, as the doctor heard him say, I think we can catch up with him this evening. I can't say I like 
like this very much. What do you mean? Driving in a cemetery at night, it gives me the creeps. Make you think of why? No. Turn left here, here. Okay. Now what? Uh, You see that big monument right ahead there? Yeah. Well, stop when you get past it. Why did you pick a place like this to bury your dough? I didn't have any choice. Why not? The cops were chasing me. I came in here to duck them. When I saw they were closing in, I quick buried the money. So is this the place? Huh? Yes, yes. Oh. Now what? Well, you see that little tombstone right over there? Yeah. Get out and see what it says on it. Oh, fine. Come on, move, will you? All right. What should it say? R.I.P. Beloved Wife Abigail. R.I.P. Beloved Wife Abigail. Well? This is it. Oh, good. Good, the box is buried right behind the stone. What'll I dig with? Use your hands. It's right under the grass. Oh. Hey. What's the matter? There's a hole here. What? Somebody's already dug it up. Don't give me that. Where is George? You know I can't move. You're, you're trying to cross me again. No, no, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth, George. Huh? Don't move, either one of you. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. How did you know we'd be here? My Brooks here tipped us off to that. What? Yes. The doctor heard you mumbling about the inscription on this tombstone. We couldn't piece it in at first, but when I learned that you'd been arrested here, the rest was easy. Oh, you stupid fool. Brooks, I think a cemetery is a fitting place to tell you that the police want to talk to you about your friend, the late Whitey Floyd. George Brooks was turned over to the local authorities. He was tried and convicted for first-degree murder. His girlfriend was sentenced to a long term in the federal penitentiary. And thus, your FBI thwarted another attempt to continue a career of crime. That the two criminals were caught is to the credit of your FBI. Because this was a case that called for trained investigation of every clue. And the added ability to weigh the value of each scrap of information. It is no accident that a special agent arrived at the correct conclusion. For the special agents of your FBI are given long courses of study in the art of investigation before they work on a single case. That is done so that you may be better protected. You. You. The American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you are what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The Equitable Man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your Equitable Representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your Equitable Man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Juvenile Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. 
This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The juvenile shakedown on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In a few minutes, someone may telephone your home to ask you a question. No, it won't be the FBI, but it may happen like this. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on now? Why, uh, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Sure I do. My good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. But just last Wednesday, my equitable representative was telling me about a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. That's a great life insurance plan. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in just 15 minutes, I'll give you full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight... FBI file, the used baby racket. When a great tragedy occurs somewhere in the world and a thousand people are killed, we read about it and we're sorry. But actually, we do not understand what we're reading. Because it's impossible for the human mind to picture a thousand people being killed at one time. But if we hear about one man being burned to death in a fire, we cringe. Not because we think it's a greater tragedy than the death of a thousand people. But because we can put ourselves in the man's place. And really understand that one single death. Now, for that reason, it may not strike you as horrible that in 1946 in these United States, there were more than a million six hundred thousand major crimes committed. None of us can realize what that number of crimes represents. But perhaps you can grasp the current crime wave statistics better when you hear that there was a job done by a criminal in the United States last year every 18 and a half seconds. In other words, since you first heard my voice, there have been three major crimes committed. Tonight's file opens in a sloppy two-room apartment on New York's east side. It is early afternoon, and Nora Beekman has just finished listening to some records on her brand-new phonograph as the doorbell rings. All right, I'm coming. Oh, you. Hi, Harry. Hello, Nora. How's Mom? Okay, she's just about rid of her cold. Oh, that's good. See, what are you doing here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? You working for Joe anymore? Oh, the cops slowed all the bookmakers in town. You're out of a job again, huh? I'll find something. I hope so. Uh, here, I brought your mail up. Oh, is that for me? Yeah. It's a package from Tommy. Maybe it's some jewelry. I understand all the soldiers in Germany send home lots of jewelry. Oh. What is it? How do you like that? Everybody else gets jewelry. My jerky husband sends me a record. Well, let's hear it. 
Maybe it's a secret message. Hello? Hello, darling. I'm in the Red Cross Clubhouse in Berlin. That's your master's voice. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm very much in love with you. But that's old news, huh? I said it so often, you must be getting a little tired of hearing it. But you better get used to it, honey. Because you'll be hearing me say I love you for the rest of your life. I got some other news for you besides that, though. I'm coming home to you and the baby. Huh? Isn't that great news? Won't oh, you? that's great. He's coming home. Well, what's wrong with that, Nora? Nothing. Nothing at all, except he's coming home to me and the baby. So? So do you see a baby anyplace around here? Hey, you're right. Where is Sonny? I met a woman in the park one day a couple of weeks ago. She thought Sonny looked so cute in the carriage. Yeah? She told me she couldn't have a baby herself, and she was trying to adopt one. Well, a lot of rich people do that. Well, they told her that she'd have to wait a year before she could adopt a baby. What's this got to do with Sonny? I sold him to her. You what? I sold her the baby for $1,000. Oh, well, I don't care about that. No, I got to have a baby to show Tommy when he gets here. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, you're a big genius. What do I do now? I don't know. Get out the way you got in. I can't. I got to have a baby. Hey, might work. What might work? I got an idea. Is this the residence of Mrs. Martin Schuyler? That's right. Are you Mrs. Schuyler? Yes, I am. Well, Mrs. Schuyler, I'm from the FBI. Yes, the FBI? Well, what do you want here? May I come in, Mrs. Schuyler? Oh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Please do. Oh, thanks. Uh, sit down anywhere, Mr. Uh... Uh, Hanover is my name, Mrs. Schuyler. Why are you here, Mr. Hanover? I'll get right to the point. Mrs. Schuyler, you bought a baby three weeks ago. Well, how did you... I don't understand how that concerns you, Mr. Hanover. Unfortunately for you, it does concern the FBI. Oh. That baby was kidnapped. Kidnapped? But I bought yes, it Yes, from... I know what you're going to say. You bought it from the baby's mother. Yes, that's right. But she wasn't the child's mother. Oh, she was the baby's nurse. Her nurse? That's right, Mrs. Schuyler. The girl confessed everything. That's how we got your name and address. Now, there are two things that you can do. What are they? You can give me the child, and I'll return it to the parents, and no one will ever know a thing about it. I see. Or you can have the girl put in jail by fighting the case. In that event, of course, there would be a lot of publicity. Oh, no, no, no. I I don't want any publicity in this matter. Well, I think you're being very smart, Mrs. Skyler. This way, no one will ever know that this whole thing happened. Yes, it's much better that way. I'll get the baby for you now. Yes, if you will. Uh, incidentally... What happens to my thousand dollars? Afraid there's no way of recovering that, Mrs. Schuyler. Nurse spent that money immediately after getting it. I see. And now may I please have the child? It's getting late for the baby to be up, and I promise I'd see to it that it slept in its own bed tonight. Yes, of course. Well, come along. The baby's room is down the hall. <laughs> Nora, 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 will you take this kid? Oh, you got him back. That's wonderful, Harry. Kiss him. Come to Mama. Uh, well, now you're all set. Gee, thanks, Harry. Am I a real genius now? Or? I'll say you are. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that in a million years. Yeah, just let me handle all your business, Nora. You got it. This dame was a real pushover for the story. Well, anybody would be. It's a real good story. I bought one of those wallets like Cary Grant used in that picture with Ingrid Bergman. Mm -hmm. But all I did was flash it, say I was with the FBI, stick it back in my pocket again. Quiet! I almost had to laugh. It was so easy. Now do you see why I got rid of the kid? This goes on all day, sometimes all night. I was going crazy. Wait till I give him this box. Yeah, uh, kids do take a lot of attention. I can rest a couple of minutes. I won't have an hour's quiet now that he's back home. If you wanted him back, don't blame me. I'm not blaming you, Harry. I've just gotten to hate all that noise. Having to stay home every night, changing his diaper, making his formula. When's the 
Tommy coming back, Nora. Oh, I played the rest of the record while you were gone. He just said soon, no date. Well, uh, how'd you like to get another thousand for Sonny? How can I? I just told you. Tommy's coming home. Besides, I just met that Mrs. Schuyler by accident. What do you want me to do? Put a sign on the baby carriage saying this baby is for sale, $1,000? hold it for a second. A friend of mine, his old man's a janitor in one of those orphan places. What about it? Think he'd want to buy something? No, 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 no. But the orphan place is getting letters all the time from people just looking for kids to adopt. So? So we have the old geezer steal some of the letters. That'll be our sucker list. That sounds like a wonderful idea. Okay. I'll get in touch with the guy tomorrow. Then we start peddling the kid again. Meanwhile, in the New York office of the FBI, Special Agent Charles Watkins is seated beside the desk of Special Agent Jim Taylor. Taylor has just finished a phone conversation. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Hey, you're on that phone a long time, Jim. Sounded like a complaint. It was a complaint. That was a Mr. Martin Schuyler, and he was protesting about an agent who came to his house while he was out of town on a business trip. Oh? Who was the agent? He was obviously an imposter. Well, what's the story? Well, it seems that about a month ago, Mrs. Schuyler met some woman in Central Park and bought her baby. She what? Yes. Pretty shocking that some people are so anxious to adopt a child and so impatient that they... Well, they go into the black market for a baby. How low can a human being get? Pretty low, judging from this. Well, what was this so-called agent's game? It was pretty clever. He told Mrs. Schuyler that the baby had been kidnapped and that the FBI would return the baby to its real home without any publicity. Which suited Mrs. Schuyler fine, I suppose. Oh, naturally. Oh, she was sorry about having to give up the child, but according to Mr. Schuyler, she was happy that there wouldn't be anything in the papers about it. You know, Jim, I should feel sorry for the Skylers, but I really don't. No, neither do I. To a great extent, they got what was coming to them. But that doesn't catch the criminals. Exactly. And that's our job. Well, Jim, what's the first move? Well, I guess the first thing to do is go out and see the Skylers. Any other record you want to hear, Harry? No, I think that'll hold me for a while. Okay. Don't you just love that phonograph? Yeah, yeah. Real good machine. I bought it with part of that first thousand dollars I got for Sonny. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the people you, you, you sold the kid to this time? A uh, Mr. and Mrs. Paul Buchanan. Oh, yeah. yeah. Plenty of dough, huh? Loaded. She gave me the thousand like it was a buck. She's going to keep calling the baby Sonny. Oh, that's nice. She asked me what to call him, so I told her that even though the baby's name was Thomas Beekman Jr., I always called him Sonny. Hey, you told her the kid's right name? Yeah, why? Well, I hate to break this news to you suddenly, but you know what we're doing is frowned upon by the police. Yeah, I know. So what? So giving your right name to people you clip is one way that they can check on you. Oh, don't be silly. Last woman didn't check, did she? Neither will this one. Well, I hope not, but I think it's about time I went out and got our little meal ticket back again. But it's only been a week since I sold her. Oh. Well, who can that be? Hello? Hiya, darling. Tommy. Yeah, that's right, honey. You surprised? Sure. Where are you? At the airport. I, uh, I got a chance to fly home, and, well, I, I wanted to see you and the baby so much, I, I took it. Oh, that, that's wonderful, dear. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll be home in about 20 minutes. All right, Tommy, I'll, I'll be here. Okay. Have a big kiss waiting for me, will yeah. you? Bye, honey. Bye. That was Tommy. I'll be here in 20 minutes. Well, I guess the honeymoon is over. What do you mean? Well, we can't go on selling the kid with Tommy home. What am I going to do, Harry? Look, uh, you've got much in the apartment that you really want. Well, besides the phonograph and my records, nothing. Why? Well, I was thinking. You know, the cops might be able to check back after we get the kid from the Buchanan. So? So why don't we just keep going? And if they do check back, let them check with Tommy. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. 
Now, a special message for men and women who are on the way up. For people who are confidently looking forward to the day when their friends will be patting them on the back and saying, Congratulations, Joe. I hear you just got promoted to a wonderful new job. Say, that's great news. You're going places. Do you expect that to happen to you in the next year or two? Well, the Equitable Society has designed a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. For people like you who expect to be earning more money three years from now. Mr. Cross, I have a hunch that applies to me. Let's hear more about this plan. Well, this Equitable Society plan for men on the way up has these three advantages. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this Equitable plan is flexible at all times can expand or contract as you see fit. The more I hear about this plan, the better I like it. How can I get the whole story? Just ask your Equitable Society representative about the Equitable Plan for People on the Way Up. Phone him as soon as possible, or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, the used baby racket. Because there are so many families in the United States who want to adopt a baby, the process of adoption often takes more than a year. And if you are one of those whose name is on a waiting list, do yourself and your prospective child a favor and wait until your name is called. Do not patronize the black market in babies. For as tonight's case in the files of your FBI proves, if you go into the black market, you are leaving yourself open to the depraved minds of criminals. In addition to that, you are trafficking in human beings, and thus... You make yourself a criminal. Tonight's file continues in the New York office of your FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from investigating a complaint. He finds Special Agent Watkins waiting for him. Hello, Charlie. Hi, Jim. Anybody call while I was out? No, Jim, not a thing. What's the story at the Buchanan's? They followed almost exactly the same procedure there as they did in the Schuyler case. The man posed as an FBI agent again, huh? That's right. And from the description Mrs. Buchanan gave me, it has to be the same man. How much did she pay for the baby? A standard rate, $1,000. Guess that must be the ceiling price for a human being. Mm-hmm. However, Mrs. Buchanan was at least a little smarter than the first customer. How do you figure that? When the imposter arrived and said he was from the FBI and that he wanted to return the baby to its rightful parents, Mrs. Buchanan said that she didn't believe him. When she refused to give up the baby? Well, she said she wanted to call the FBI to check whether or not he was a legitimate agent. What happened then? He slugged her, then locked her in a closet. Mm Mm-hmm. And when she came to, the baby was gone. That's it. But we have more to work on this time than we did after Mrs. Schuyler was swindled. Oh, in what way? Well, for one thing, Mrs. Buchanan found out the right name of the child. How did she do that? Well, the woman who sold the baby told her, quite by accident, that the child's name was Thomas Beekman, Jr. There must be plenty of Beekmans in New York, if that's the right name. We've got another clue that should isolate the area where they live. Well, let's have it. Well, Mr. Buchanan remembered that the woman told her that one of the reasons she was glad to sell the baby is that now it would be able to get some sleep. She said the elevated trains kept the baby awake. Hey, there's only one elevated train still running in New York. Mm, That's what I meant when I said the area was isolated for it. I think I'll ask the telephone company to check and see if they've got any Thomas Beekman listed on 3rd Avenue. Good. While you're doing that, I'll get in touch with the milk company, see if they're delivering any milk to a Mrs. Thomas Beekman. I'll check back here with you in half an hour. Okay, Charlie, let's go to work. Is your name Thomas Beekman? Yeah, that's right. Who are you? I'm from the FBI, Mr. Beekman. Here are my credentials. 
and the FBI. And something has happened to my wife and baby. Where are they? Uh, calm down, Mr. Bigman. May I come in? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Come on in. Thanks. I've been going crazy waiting. I was just going to phone the police. I see you're in uniform, Mr. Bigman. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm still in the service. I just got back from Germany today. Uh-huh. What ship did you come back on? No ship. I, I flew back. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Yes, I think I do, Mr. Bigman. You don't in the least resemble the man I'm looking for. The man you're looking for? Here? Hey, what is this? Mr. Bigman, when did you last see your wife? I haven't seen her since I got back. As soon as the plane landed, I called her from the airport. And she was here? Yeah, and then I told her I'd be home in 20 minutes. When I got here, she and the baby was gone. Is your baby's name Thomas Beekman Jr.? Yes, sir, that's right. Is your wife blonde, rather small, and very pretty? Yes, sir, that's Nora. And do you by any chance know a man about, oh, six feet tall, slim, good-looking, with blonde hair and a light mustache? That sounds like Nora's brother, Harry, but uh-huh. tell me what's happened. Well... Well, this is rather difficult to tell you, but... Well, Mr. Beekman, your wife and her brother have gone into the business of selling your baby. No, that can't be. I felt the same way when I heard about it the first time. And where's my baby now? I'm sorry, but I, I don't know. He might be with your wife, or... She might have sold him again by this time. Oh, no. No, I... I can't believe that Nora would do that. Mr. Beekman, let's try to do something that'll bring your baby back to you. Now, tell me, what is your brother-in-law's full name? Harry Jackson, but... It... I don't know where he lives, though. I see. Do you mind if I take a look around the apartment? No, 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 sir. Go go right ahead. Thanks. Maybe I can find something here that'll lead us to your wife and brother and your baby. (laughs) Nora, give that kid a bottle or anything that'll keep him quiet. Now you see what I used to go through. Uh. Drink this. Funny, isn't it? What's funny? You give a baby a bottle and he stops making noise. You give a grown-up a bottle and that's when he starts making noise. That's funny? Sorry, it amused me. Don't get sarcastic with me. Oh, shut up. You're getting on my nerves. I'll get on your nerves even more if I don't do anything but sit around this apartment all day and all night. Relax. The only thing that can spoil everything now is we get caught by the cops. We'll stay undercover for a week or so, and then you can go out and call on the next sucker. But do you think it's safe here? Why don't we get out of New York? Look, all the names on our sucker list are right here in New York. If we leave town, we've got to get another list. But how do you know we're safe in this apartment? It belongs to a legitimate friend of mine who went to South America. He won't be back till June. Okay. You're the genius. How many times do you think we can sell, Sonny, before your friend gets back? Well, how do I know? We'll sell him as many times as we can. <laughs> find out, Johnny. Well, Jim, I waited over at the office of that pediatrician that used to treat the Beekman child. Yeah. But he said he hadn't heard from Mrs. Beekman in three weeks. I didn't suppose she'd take too good a care of the baby. Oh, I left our number with him. He'll call us if he does hear from her. Oh, good. I assume you didn't have any luck either. No, none at all. You remember I found that bottle of medicine in the bathroom cabinet at the Beekman? Yeah, the one that said take as directed? That's the one. Well, I called the drugstore, gave them the number of the prescription. They told me what it was, but they said that lots of babies take those pills. They're just vitamin pills. Jim, there must be some clue as to where they went. Well, I hope there is, but I can't think of what it would be. All we know is they're probably still somewhere in New York. Yeah, every check we've made would seem to indicate they are. But what makes you so sure they still got the baby with them? Jackson went back to the Buchanan apartment to get the child, didn't he? If he didn't want it, he wouldn't have done that. I guess you're right, Jim. Well, maybe the police will come up with a clue. They've sent out an alarm. Every policeman in the city is looking for them. That should keep them from moving around very much. Yeah. As long as they have the baby with them, they'll be staying home nights taking care of him. You can be sure of that. Charlie, why didn't I think of that before? Think of what? Hand me that phone. I've got an idea. Well, where have you been? Oh, just went around the corner for some cigarettes. What'd they do? Make them for you by hand? You've been gone two hours. I got tired of waiting for you to come back. 
You got tired of waiting for me. Oh, I know it takes time, Nora. I just needed some cigarettes. Is that a crime or something? Okay, okay, okay. How'd you make out with Mrs. Atwater? She's going to buy some. How much? She was wearing a brand new mink coat, so I jacked up the price. We got 1500 this time. Good for you. I meet her tomorrow morning at 11. She said she'd pay for Sonny in cash. Hey, who can that be? I don't know. Oh, maybe it's one of George's friends who doesn't know he's out of town. Good afternoon. Mrs. Beekman here. Mrs. Who are you? I'm from the FBI. Here are my credentials. And these are genuine, Mr. Jackson. How do you know my name? And what do you do? Step back, Jackson. Let me come in. The FBI, Mrs. Beekman. Well, well, I'm glad to see your child asleep in the carriage. I was afraid you might have sold him again before we got here. Say, gee, man, tell me one thing, will you? What do you want to know? How'd you find us here? We were almost stymied until I remembered that all babies need one thing. What's that? Diapers. So I called every diaper service in New York. One of them told me that Mrs. Beekman had moved, and they gave me this new address. Whoa. And uh, speaking of addresses, Mrs. Beekman, I have an idea you and your brother will have the same address for some time to come. Prison. Harry Jackson and Mrs. Beekman were tried and convicted and are now serving long terms in prison. When they finish, Jackson will serve an additional five years in a federal penitentiary for having impersonated a member of the FBI. And in that manner, the sordid criminal careers of two inhuman people were brought to a finish by your FBI. Tonight's case from the files is indicative of one thing, and that is that there are no depths to which the criminal is incapable of sinking in the commission of a crime. There are no bounds of decency which the criminal recognizes. And in his own tortured mind, there's nothing wrong in stealing from someone who is not quite as cunning as he is. Only the shrewd deserve to survive is his motto. But what he never realizes until too late is that the forces of law and order are shrewd and cunning themselves. And like your FBI, utterly relentless. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The equitable man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your equitable representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options when my income increases? You bet it does. Your equitable man will give you all the facts on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book under Equitable Society... Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Patient. <laughs> The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweet. The music was composed by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your F. FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time 
when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Curious Patient on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, while you're listening to this program, your telephone may ring. Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Why, yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's, this is your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Oh, uh, sure I do. It's my good friends, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Just last Wednesday, my Equitable representative told me about a special life insurance plan for men on the way up. Believe me, that's a great idea. So naturally, I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. And in 15 minutes, I'll give you full information about the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Tonight's FBI file, The Henpecked Thief. Crime as a business is in the midst of a great boom at the moment, with more than 5,000 major crimes being committed in the United States every day. But do not labor under the delusion that those are 5,000 successful crimes. The prison population of the country is larger today than it has ever been, and it continues to grow. Even those engaged in a life of crime who have not yet been caught do not live the life of ease that popular fiction would have you believe. For the criminal, in choosing his career of crime, has automatically sacrificed many of the comforts which you law-abiding citizens take for granted. The night file opens in a small apartment located in the residential section of San Francisco. One of the occupants of the flat, Phyllis West, is just answering the front door. Hello, Phyllis. Oh, hello, Mom. Come on in. Thanks. I was doing some shopping in the neighborhood. I thought I'd drop by and see you. Gee, I'm glad you did. Where's that husband of yours? Well, he... he's here. Where? It's in the bedroom. Still sleeping? Well, yes. Phyllis. Do you know what time it is? Well, it's two not... o'clock in the afternoon, and he's still pounding the pillow. Well, he, he didn't get home until very late. Was he working? No. Any sign of him getting a job? He told me he'd got some things lined up. Oh, he's been handing you that for a month. Phyllis, I'm going to have a talk with him. After all, you're my daughter, and I won't hey, stand... Phyllis, by... have you seen my... Uh... Oh, hello, Mrs. Bartow. Good morning. Phyllis, have you seen that new striped tie? Oh, yes, it's in the hall closet. I'll get it. Just a minute. Let him get it himself. Huh? She's not doing any more waiting on you. What is it? Sit down. W- Sit the... down, I said. Okay. Now, I want to have a talk with you. Please, Mother. You keep out of this. Young man, when my daughter married you, it was against my better judgment. But I agreed to the match because she believed you had a very bright future. Well, you've been married three years now, and what's happened? Well, I've been doing things, Mrs. Bartow. You've barely made enough to live on. Well, I just haven't got the brain. Oh, stop. Sixteen-year-old kids are stealing better than you are. 
No, that ain't so. Look at the papers. Every day they say crime waves are getting bigger and bigger. That's just publicity. Well, whatever it is, you're not cashing in on it. Oh, lay off, will you? Why, when my husband was alive, he stole better in depression years than you could with a boom on. All right, I've heard enough of this. Hal, where are you going? I'm getting out of here. I haven't finished with you, young man. Oh, yes, you have. <laughs> Bartender. Hey, bartender. Hello, Al. Huh? Oh, hello, Duke. Sit down. Thanks. Hey, where's that bartender? He's busy, loading in some ice. I need some whiskey, Duke. You seem to be doing okay now, Al. Oh, I'm just getting started, boy. What are you celebrating? This ain't a celebration. It's a wake. What's wrong? Everything. <laughs> Can't be that bad. Duke, I, I've just been thinking about something. Want to hear it? Sure, why not? Years ago, way, way back when I was a kid, I lived with my uncle. That's on account of my mother and father were dead. Uh -huh. well, my uncle was a nice enough guy, strictly a nine-to-five character, you know, legit. Yeah. I guess I'd still be with him if it wasn't for one thing. What's that? He had a stupid wife and a mean mother-in-law. I figured, well, there you are. That's what happens to legit. So I ran away and became a thief. I see. Figured I'd, I'd get action. You know, high living, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been a thief for over ten years, and what have I got to show for it, huh? Stupid wife, mean mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> you do need a drink. <laughs> That's why I'll buy you one as soon as the bartender gets back. Look, do... <laughs> Duke, do you happen to know my mother-in-law? Oh, yes. What a nagger. I remember her when her husband was alive. She is a forceful woman. All the time she's at me to do something big. Gotta have to, me to be a star or something. Gee, I, I, I make out all right, Duke. I crack as good a safe as any guy in the business. <laughs> Just haven't got the brakes, that's all. Well, I'm glad I ran into you. Why? You may be just the man I'm looking for. What do you mean? I've got a job lined up. It's a real big job. One that would actually make your mother-in-law proud of him. No kidding, Duke. Mm -hmm. What's the setup? Yeah, well, let's get a drink at the bar. Then we'll go someplace private and talk. Two days later, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor is just completing the phone conversation. Well, Sheriff, I guess I have all the details now. Yes, I'll be up there in half an hour. Right. Bye. Morning, Jim. Oh, morning, Elliot. If you're not busy, we could go over that Wilton file. Well, not right now, Elliot. I've got to run upstate. What for? Well, Sheriff up in Canton just called. They had a bank robbery up there last night. Really? What's the story? The thieves gained entry through a skylight on the roof. Uh-huh. They cut the alarm wires, then blew the vault. How much did they get? Let's see, um, $18,640. Whoa. Any leads, Jim? Well, Sheriff said there were a few clues, but the bandits themselves made a clean getaway. Oh. I'm going up there now. Uh, can I do anything for you here at this end? Nothing that I know of now. I'll be in touch with you later. Just a minute. Oh, hello, Mom. Gee, I'm glad you're here. As soon as I got your message, I ran right over. Well, what's wrong? It's Al. Well? I'm worried about him. What did he do now? He didn't come home all night. Oh, is that all? Mother, he's never done this before. I hope he makes it a habit, permanently. Mother, you shouldn't say those things. I love Al. I know. Have you tried to locate him? Oh. Call saloons, pool rooms, bookmakers. Oh, he wouldn't be at any of those places. How do you know? He wasn't when he called. When did he call? Last night, about midnight. Said he was going to do a real big job. One that we'd both be very proud of. That eliminates pool rooms and bookmakers. Huh? Just call the saloons. He must be drinking. Oh, he was very serious. Look, I've heard his routines before. This time, he's not getting away with it. I'm waiting here until he gets home. <laughs> Uh, 
Hiya, Jim. Oh, hello, Elias. When would you get back? Just a few minutes ago. How'd you make out up there? Well, I didn't come up with anything definite on the identity of the bank robbers, but I did get a couple of fairly good leads. What are they? It appears that two men did the job. How'd you arrive at that? Well, as you know, the bank was entered through a skylight on the roof. Yes? They used a ladder to get onto the roof. It was still propped against the rear wall of the bank. Oh? The ground was pretty soggy back there, and at the base of the ladder, there were two distinct sets of footprints. Did you take an impression of them? Yes, cast it there on my desk. Oh, yes. I also measured the strides. The laboratory should be able to give us the approximate weight and height of the men. What else did you get? Well, apparently only one of the men climbed the ladder. There was only one set of muddy footprints on the roof. The other man acted as a lookout? Evidently. This first man broke the skylight glass to gain entry. Oh, I found this piece of material. It could have been torn from his coat. It was caught on the broken glass. Any fingerprints, Jim? Yes, I picked up several distinct prints in the skylight. They're in that envelope there. What'd you get inside the bank? Well, the cracksman muffled the safe before he blew it open, but that won't do much help to us. Why not? He used army blankets, and they're on sale now to the general public, so they'd be pretty difficult to trace. Well, Jim, it looks as if you've got everything but the bandits themselves. I'm hoping the laboratory will fill that in for us. Phyllis, what? will you stop that crying? I, I can't help it. Look, nothing's happened to him. He'll be home. No, he won't, Mommy. I'm sure of it now. Al's left oh, me. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I know he has. He just got fed up with you picking on him the way you do. Now, just a minute, Phyllis. You've been very I'll mean be... to him, Mommy. He's a very sensitive fellow. Look, for the last time, I'm Al, to... is that you? Yeah, honey. There, you see? What did I tell you? Oh, Al, I'm, I'm so glad to see you. Well, what's the matter, baby? I've been worried to death about you. Now, look, I told you I was going out on a job. Now, let's have the real story. What do you mean? Where you've really been. I took a bank last night. <sighs> you what? Done a bank job, knocked off 18000 Oh, I don't believe it. No? Take a look. This morning's paper right here, front page. How many things? Baby, right here, you see? What? Daring upstate bank robbery. Uh -huh. Let me look. First National Bank of Canton was robbed last night of over $18,000. Daring bandits gain entry through Skylight. Daring hey, bandits, that's oh, it. Oh, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, <clears throat> what have you got to say, Mrs. Bartow? I'm stunned. That should sort of make you change your mind about me now, huh? <laughs> Of course, doesn't it, Mommy? Well, I... You were all the time at me to do something big. Is that big enough for you? Yes, I guess it is. Okay. <laughs> Baby, I'm hungry. Oh, you must be. Well, how about fixing me some food? I'd like a little attention around here. Mrs. Bartow. Yes, sir. Get out in the kitchen. Give your daughter a hand. Oh, yes, of course I... Hey, wait a minute. Well? You say you got $18,000 for the job. That's right. Where is it? I'm getting it tomorrow. Your what? Well, the guy I'd done the job with took it back to his hotel. See, some of it was in securities. He's taken them to a fence. I don't believe it. I'll call his hotel and prove it. Hello? Did you get me to Central Hotel? Who is this guy you've done the job with? Uh, Duke Shelton. Duke Shelton? Yeah, that's right. Duke Shelton. Oh, you stupid... You let him take all the money? Yeah, why? He's the biggest double-crosser in the business. Oh, you're crazy. Duke, Duke Shelton is off. Of Hello. all the people. Hello, Duke Mr. Shelton. Shelton. Mother, how do you know about this, Mr. Shelton? He pulled the same deal on your father years ago. Hello? Huh? Are you sure? Oh, what is it? You checked out. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file will be reopened in just a moment. Now, a special message to men and women who are on the way up. The people who are going to open their doors to good news like this soon. Hey, Mary, I got a raise, a big one. We're going places. If you're that kind of person, bound and determined to get ahead, then be sure to investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A plan for people of all ages who expect to be earning more money three years from now. You mean that the Equitable Society takes my chances of future success into consideration? It certainly does. The Equitable Society's plan for men on the way up has these three advantages. First, it gives you and your family needed protection right now. Second, this Equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. 
Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. Third, this equitable plan is flexible at all times, can expand or contract as you see fit. That sounds like a smart plan to me. Where do I find out about it? There's nothing easier. Ask your Equitable Society representative for full information on the Equitable Plan for Men and Women on the Way Up. Phone him as soon as possible, or send a postcard care of his station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file, The Henpecked Thief. There are many widespread misconceptions about the criminal population of the country. A population numbering close to six million people. Some of those misconceptions are that all criminals are stupid people who have had no educational advantages. Another is that there is a criminal type who can be recognized and is distinguishable from the honest law-abiding citizen. And perhaps the most widespread incorrect notion is that they are loyal to each other. The bromide words it, there is honor among thieves. As can be seen from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, nothing could be further from the truth. No criminal has any loyalty to another criminal for one basic reason. His mind is incapable of understanding the rudiments of loyalty. Above the mythical coat of arms of every criminal is a motto which reads, It's every man for himself. Tonight's file continues at the San Francisco field office of the FBI. Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk. Say, Jim, hmm? any report from the laboratory on that bank robbery? Yes, I should say there is. What'd you get? Well, first of all, one of the bandits has been identified. His name is Al West. Did they get that from the fingerprints? That's right. What's his record? Two arrests for safe cracking. Oh, they were local jobs. Didn't come under our jurisdiction. Any idea where to find him? Well, police headquarters gave me an address for him. I checked and found he'd lived there until a year ago, but he moved and... That's where the trail ends. I see. We've got a trace out on him now, though. What about the second man? Well, the only identification we have on him is the one that the laboratory reconstructed. How? Well, judging by the depth of his footprint, the length of his stride, he was a big man. Six feet one or two. Weighed over 250 pounds. Uh, that doesn't suggest anyone I know of offhand. Oh, we're checking on it. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yes, Sergeant. You did? Will you let me have it, please? 920 Oak Street. Got it. Thanks a lot, Sergeant. Bye. Well, that's a break. What, Jim? That was Sergeant Myers at police headquarters. He picked up Al West on suspicion about a month ago. He was living then at 920 Oak Street. I'd better get right over there. Want me to fix you some coffee? No. A sandwich, maybe? I don't want nothing. I wish you wouldn't act this way. Oh, baby, I feel awful. I figured at last I, I'd done something big. Something even your mother would be proud of. Oh, she's really got me nailed now. She understands. I'm sure she does. Well, then why didn't she let me go over to Duke Shelton's hotel? Why did she have to go? She's handled these things before, Al. She knows better what to do. Well, I could find out where he's gone as good as she could. Well, maybe. Look, are you rooting against me, too? Oh, of course not. Well, then why do you have... Oh, is that you, Mom? Yes. How'd you make out? Well, I have to spread a little dough around, but I finally got a line on where Shelton's gone. Who from? Guy at the transportation desk. I slipped him 20 bucks, and he told me the Duke had bought a plane ticket to Los Angeles. Oh, that's a break. Los Angeles, that's a big place. That don't tell us much. If we could find out one thing, it could tell us plenty. What's that? Is there a racetrack open down there? Yeah, sure. That's all we need to know. Why? I know Duke Shelton, 
Every time he's ever made a score, he's fed it right back to the horses. Well, I don't say he'll do it this time. Young man, once a horse player, always a horse player. We're flying to Los Angeles. <laughs> Oak Street Apartments. What number are you calling? Oh, you got the wrong number. Oh, excuse me. Yes? I'm looking for Mr. Al West. He's not in. When is he expected back? Mm, not for some time. He went out of town. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Hmm? Here are my credentials. Oh, I see. Now, do you know where Al West is going? Well, no, sir. He left about two hours ago. His wife and his mother-in-law were with him. Mm -hmm. They said they were going out of town indefinitely. I wonder if I could see their apartment. I have a warrant here. Oh, sure thing. Excuse me, let me get this call first. Certainly. Oak Street Apartments. Uh, just a minute. This is a call for Mrs. Bartow. Hmm? She's West's mother-in-law. Oh, we'll find out who it is. Yeah. Uh, who's calling, please? I see. Uh, hold it. The transportation desk at the Central Hotel. Let me talk to them, will you? Okay. Wait a second. Here. Thanks. Hello? Well, she's not in. May I take the message? Yes. What's your name, please? I see. I'm a special agent of the FBI. I wonder if you'd wait at the hotel for me. I want to get all the details. Well, Elliot, over here. Oh, fine. Hop in. Right. Now, what's this all about? Well, I'll try to give you the complete story on it. I went over to West's apartment. He'd left town with his wife and mother-in-law. I see. While I was there, a call came in from the transportation man at the Central Hotel. He had a message for Mrs. Bartow. That's the mother-in-law. Uh -huh. It was intriguing enough for me to go over to the hotel and question him. What'd you get? Well, the mother-in-law had been over there earlier. She'd given him money to learn where one of the guests at the hotel had gone. Who was the guest? A man named Shelton. From his description, I'm certain that it was an old-time thief called Duke Shelton. Yeah, I've heard of him. And he's a big man. About six feet two, weighs around 250 pounds. The other bank robber? Appears that way. It also appears there's been a double cross of some kind. How's that? Well, the woman was pretty mad about Shelton checking out. Said she had to find him. Where had he gone? To Los Angeles. How come the transportation man called her back? Oh, he'd gotten some additional information that Shelton was going to stay at the El Cerrito Hotel in Los Angeles. Where are you going now? Back to the office to pick up Shelton's record. Then we're flying down there. Phyllis! Phyllis, I'm over here. Oh, hi, Ma. Did you see any sign of Duke Shelton? No, did you? No. You know what he looks like, don't you? Yeah, a, a big, tall, fat man, kind of old. That's it. Where's Al? I don't know. I thought he... Oh, there he is, over there. Where? Right there, talking to that fellow in the check coat. A tout. Huh? He's talking to a tout, and he's still got my change from the plane tickets. Let's get over there quick. No, Mom, don't go picking We're on We're here to find Shelton, not to play horses. Hey, Al. Uh, yes, Mrs. Bartlett. Come here. What's the matter? Did you find him? No. Who were you talking to? A nice guy. Do you know him? No, but he's got something real good in the next race. Oh, you're not only stupid, you're a square. Young man, you stay with me. How'd you make out, Jim? I just spoke to the desk clerk. Yes? He said that Shelton came here to the El Cerrito about 1 o'clock, but he didn't like the room they showed him, so he decided not to check in. What about West? Did he show up? No, no, but I didn't expect he would. All he and his family knew about Shelton was that he'd come to Los Angeles. They didn't get the information that he was on his way to this hotel. Did the clerk have any idea where Shelton went? Yes, he hired a car to go to the racetrack. Let's see, it's after 4 o'clock now. Mm -hmm. We could just about make it before the last race. Yes. Well, it'll be like looking for a needle in a haystack, but let's go. Well, 
Hmm? Elliot, I just went to the $100 ticket seller and showed him Duke Shelton's picture. Did he recognize him? Yes, he's been betting with him all day. How about this race? He bet uh, number seven. That's a horse called Best Girl. It's just about post time. Yeah, I know. And this is the last race. Won't have much chance to look for him. The only break we can get is if Best Girl wins and Shelton goes back to the payoff window. They're off! Come on, Best Girl. <laughs> Did you bet on Come him? Come on, Timberline! 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 Oh, how do you like that? Best girl winners. I asked you, did you bet on that Timberline? Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna murder that bum in the check coat. That was my money. Oh, shut up! What? I, I mean, mother, I think I found him. Huh? That man over there going into the stands. Is that him? Yeah. For sure, that's Shelton. Come on. Oh, I gotta hand it to you, Mrs. Bartow. You had the right idea. I knew he'd come here. Hey, look. Look, he's going to the $100 cashier window. He's had a winner. He must still have the dough. Yes, let's nail him right now. Okay. Oh, hello there, Duke. Huh? Duke, you remember my mother-in-law. What are you doing here? I've come to collect. I've come to collect, too, Shelton. Huh? Who are you? A special agent of the FBI. Mother, you're getting out of here. Here we are, all of you. Hey, what is this? Well, finding you here, too, West, I'd say we've hit the daily double. Duke Shelton received a 15-year sentence and Al West five years for their robbery of the Canton Bank. Thus, your FBI was able to close another file and write the word convicted upon the face of it. The fact that these criminals were caught is not the important thing to you unless you happen to own a bank. But the thing that is important to you is the manner in which they were caught the manner in which your FBI pursued to the logical conclusion every clue until they came to the telephone message from the porter at the hotel. For it is that devotion to detail that makes your FBI the organization it is, the organization that acts to protect you, the American people, against the army of six million criminals. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. If you're what President Thomas I. Parkinson of the Equitable Society describes as a man with faith in his own future and the future of America, then you'll surely want to learn more about the Equitable Society plan for men on the way up. Exactly how much will this plan cost me? The equitable man has the answer. How much protection does it give me right now? Your equitable representative can work that out in two minutes. Does this plan offer me desirable options? You bet it does. Your equitable man will be glad to give you further facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Find him in the phone book under Equitable Society or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the used baby racket. Incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, 
is a Jerry Devine production. This is Milton Cross speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the used baby racket on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.